for uh, introducing me and thank you for inviting me here to talk. Um, I wanted to start out with giving a very basic introduction to Hyde for people who have never heard of what Hyde is. I guess more than half of you probably have. I'll just start out with these with this basic basic notion anyway. So, I mean, what a Hyde is, it takes an algebraic number, so the zero of a polynomial and rational coefficients to a non-negative real number that is in some way a measure for how, how many bits a computer would need to store the information in this algebraic number. So, uh, that's essentially my only connection to maybe the Univall Foundation or computer science. So I just want to define the height of an algebraic number by fixing the minimal polynomial of alpha. So I fix polynomial and integral, integral coefficients that is irreducible as an integral polynomial. So that means uh, the, the coefficients are, in particular, co-prime. And I'll just write down what this polynomial looks like, a naught a d. Uh, I can assume without loss of generality that a d leading coefficient, coefficient is positive, and these uh, conditions force p to be unique. So there's a unique polynomial with these properties. <coughs> Given this polynomial, I can just write down the height as follows. What I essentially do is I take the leading term, which essentially saves the information, the finite information of alpha, and then I multiply it with the product over all conjugates of my alpha that lie outside the unit circle. So I'm taking the product over all zeros of p, uh, taken as complex numbers. And just to normalize everything, I take log of this expression and divide it by the degree of the minimal polynomial. So this is just for normalization purposes. And quite obviously, this guy is, is going to be non-negative. <coughs> So this is now a well-defined map. Taking an algebraic number to a non-negative real number, and it somehow it should measure. I mean, if I multiply this guy with d, then I can get somehow a measure for the number of bits I would need to save the information uh, in this algebraic number alpha. <coughs> OK, so just as a very basic example, if I want to calculate the height of a rational number, I can easily write down what the minimal polynomial is. And well, p and q are here integers. And I get a, exactly logarithm of the maximum of numerator and denominator. So nothing, nothing deep here. And for example, well, if I, if I plug in. 0, I get 0. And if I, get, if I plug in an, an algebraic number, a root of unity, so I also get 0. So from the basic fact, I mean, all conjugates of a root of unity lie on the unit circle. So the product here is 1. So AD is going to be 1, 2, because it's an algebraic integer. And so the height will be 0. So we get a lot of points of, of minimal height, where the height is 0. And so my talk is somehow maybe about points of algebraic numbers of small height, height positive but sufficiently close to zero. Why is the minus of the minimal one not have to do with the number of bits? Well, I guess you can somehow, well, if you multiply this by d, um, it's not exactly the, the L infinity norm of, of this vector here, but you can compare it to the L infinity norm of this vector here. So you, you probably also have to save d. To, to recover the full, to recover the, the minimal polynomial, or at least get a finite number of actually. <coughs> so these cover the algebraic numbers of, of minimal height. And for, I mean, the height is also a use, useful concept in, in, in diophantine fan equations because of this basic fact, which is sometimes attributed to Northcott. And it says that. Well, if I want to show that a certain set of algebraic numbers is finite, I just have to show that it has fine, a bounded height and bounded degree. 
So the claim is that for all parameters b and d, if I look at the set of points of height at most b, whose degree over q is at most d, then this is finite. So this is, again, something not too difficult to show. You just essentially have to compare this expression here with the L infinity norm of the minimal polynomial. So once you get a bound for this and the degree, you'll get essentially bound for the, for the coefficients of this guy. And because they're integral, you only have a finite number of possibilities for those. <coughs> OK, so Northcott's theorem is also useful because it actually can be used to show somehow a converse of this statement here. That's sometimes attributed to Kronecker. And this classifies the algebraic numbers of height 0. So alpha is height 0 if and only if alpha is 0 or alpha. Why do you say attributed? Is it even proven? <laughs> <laughs> well, I say that because I actually didn't read the paper where oh, it, you know, <laughs> uh, But you probably didn't use this. You, you probably said something like an algebraic integer whose conjugates are on the unit circle has to be root of unity, something like that. <coughs> okay, so you got this equivalence. One side is, is that from the definition, and the other side um, is height zero implies one of those guys. And to prove that, well, you just have to find out if, if you have height zero, I mean, then you're on the unit circle. All conjugates are on the unit circle. The AD is, is 1. And then you'll find that the height of alpha squared is also 0. The conjugates of alpha squared will lie on the unit circle. Alpha squared will be an algebraic integer. And you do that with alpha cubed and so on. So all powers of alpha of height 0. Now, the set of bounded height and bounded degree is finite which means exactly two of these, two different powers of alpha have to coincide. That's exactly what it means to say that alpha is either zero or root of unity. So, <coughs> so that's, that's that result. And we got the, the points of the algebraic numbers of minimal height. And so the next question is, how small can you get? And this is also a simple example. If you take 2 to the 1 over d, well, that's an algebraic number of degree exactly d. The minimal polynomial is something you can write down. It's t to the d minus 2. And the height is as simple as possible. Essentially, just take the logarithm of that number, get log 2 over d. So as d tends to infinity, this height will tend to 0 linearly, like 1 over d. <coughs> And so the, the best known lower, lower bound from a uh, qualitative point of view is this re result of Dubrovolsky. It's from the 70s, so I think it's 1970, 1979. And it holds for all algebraic numbers whose height are po with positive height. If you have positive height, then it's at least its height is at least 1 over d times some, some constant. That's just a, an absolute constant times something that is slightly less than 1. So log 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 d over log log d cubed. And here d is just a degree as above. So this c is, I think you can take it to be equal to a quarter. So it's just some universal constant here in this lower bound. So this is the best, poss best known lower bound. And the question if it's best possible or not, um, sorry, I get this mixed up here. This should be log, log d. Oh, so log d. So this actually has to, it tends to 0 quite slowly in d. And the question is if you can omit this, this factor. That's a no. If this factor is actually necessary. And this is a long-standing open problem due to Lamer. And uh, the conjecture usually attributed to Lamer asks if you can replace here this, this logarithmic garbage by 1. So 
Those are exist to constant C such that if you have positive height, then you, event, you, you have height that is bounded below by something by this constant divided by D. So essentially, this is as bad as you can, as low as you can get. <coughs> so this is from the 1930s. And I think this, even this exponent hasn't been improved since, uh, since over 30 years. <coughs> Okay. So how wise is it to write on the last blackboard behind here? It's probably not at all. So if you have an algebraic number of large degree, you can't really expect its height to be, to be large, it can, can have very small height. And uh, so it's somewhat surprising that you have this result, result due to Jinsel from the 1970s. And you get actually a lower bound for the height that is independent of the degree, but only for a certain class of algebraic numbers. <coughs> so what he does is he takes a set of algebraic numbers whose conjugates lie on the real line. These are called the totally real algebraic numbers. And if alpha happens to be not the trivial exceptions, where the height is zero for free, then, then its height is at least one half times log of the golden ratio. So in this special case, you can't get arbitrarily close to zero if the conjugates, all conjugates, lie on the, on the real line. And this is also, this is best possible here, this constant. <coughs> and the reason why this holds true can be explained, at least from a qualitative point of view, by an equidistribution result. And this equidistribution result, in some way, it tells you what it means to have small height. And this, the theorem goes back to Bilou from the 1990s. So you can, Schinzel didn't have this theorem, but this theorem can be used to give a, give a, qual, a lower bound here that is, is, is the, a positive lower bound. <coughs> so what does this theorem say? Suppose you have a sequence of algebraic numbers. I'm going to exclude roots of unity in, in zero, just to avoid trivialities. And suppose that this sequence is small, meaning that the height tends to zero as alpha tends, as n tends to infinity. And the theorem tells us something about how the conjugates of alpha are distributed in the complex plane. We saw that the points of height zero are exactly roots of unity, so they're perfectly aligned on the, the unit circle, and they're, they're essentially, they are very well equidistributed around the unit circle. And what Bilo's theorem says is if you have a sequence like this, then the conjugates of alpha um, define a measure that converges weakly to the standard Haar measure on uh, S1. So, and you have the following. I'll write it down explicitly. Um, the bounded continuous function on the complex plane, on the, uh, on the complex numbers, minus the origin. And if you um, take the average over the conjugates, of alpha n, you have to take the average, so you divide by the degree. Number of embeddings in total. Then this guy here converges to the integral of this bounded function uh, on the unit circle. So.
Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there, I don't know if there's a proof of that by equidistribution. There is, I think, a proof of this by equidistribution. Just click. Uh, but about the sol numbers, I don't know. Yeah, but there's yeah you have to choose a good test function to get this bound here. But for more uh, intricate values. Mm. Oh. We'll see a few later on, too. But here, this is, so at least, I mean, it's somehow a different problem because here the height U is really small. It's, it's like 1 over D, and here it just tends to 0. It could go very, goes here very slowly. So you can't get too much information out of this here, at least not for, for Lemur's problem. So I mean, now it's, it's kind of obvious what happens if you have if you have a, a point, an algebraic number of small height, its conjugates have to, well, they have to be symmetric with respect to the x-axis, and they're somehow close to the unit circle. Of course, you can have like guys way outside, but on average, they'll be equidistributed around the unit circle. If you're a totally real algebraic number, you're exactly on the real line, so there's no way you're going to be equidistributed. You just take a test function that has support, say, here, and if you're on the real line, the integral will be zero. Uh, whereas this year, um, the integral will be non-zero, or this will be zero. Does, okay. does this theorem give you the, the lower bound of the log there, or not? Um, I, I believe there is a proof using this theorem that gives a, a good lower bound that goes that gives this. I think it gives this log, and it gives even that this this lower bound this value here is is isolated as a as a height value, but just using uh, a silly test function, like on this picture, you can't, you just get a, some x file. <coughs> okay, so this theorem of Schinzel. There's a certain infinite well, MQ or the maximal totally real extensions of Q. That's a, it's a field. It's not a number field. It's not a finite extension of Q. So we're going to call a field contained in Q bar has has the Bogomolov property. Write it with a Russian B. <coughs> if there exists positive epsilon, that may depend on the field with, well, if you have an, an alpha, an F, then the height is either zero or it's at least epsilon. <coughs> so this is Bogomolov property. Uh, the name Bogomolov, I think, was first used in a paper by, by uh, Bombieri and Zanier. And it plays on the, the, the Bogomolov conjecture for, for points of small height on sub-varieties of abelian varieties. It also has to do with small height, but it's in a slightly different context. But still, the serves as a motivation. <coughs> <coughs> So equidistribution is actually quite useful for this Bogomolov property, too. It would be nice to have some kind of unifying treatment of everything. And still, I guess the main problem or question is, is there a way to characterize fields with this property B um, apart from just the definition? Uh, so the examples I already gave are, well, the immediate example is a number field, so a finite extension of Q. That follows, for example, from this theorem of Northcott I wrote down at the very beginning, or from the theorem of Dobrovolsky, which is, of course, much deeper than what you would need. Um, <coughs> these are somehow the obvious examples. And the first non-obvious example in my talk here is this maximal totally real extension of Q. So these are the ones I have now. We're going to see some, some
some guys later on. <coughs> um, so I guess the main problem is characterized fields with B. Essentially, we'll see two different kinds of classes of fields with this Bogomolov property. There doesn't seem to be a unifying way to treat them at the moment. <coughs> and let me just give you a flavor of what this property entails. So one natural question is, is the Bogomolov property is it preserved under finite field extension? So in, the answer is, unfortunately, no. Is not, is not preserved. preserved. This is originally due to uh, Amoroso and Lucho, and the, the example I'm going to give is due to Amoroso, David, and Zanier. And you start out with a field, we already see, we already know that has a Bogomolov property, maximal totally real extension of Q. And we just do a quadratic extension of this guy, region squared of minus one. This is a maximal CM extension, if you want. And um, this contains the following elements. Certainly contains this guy here. We're allowed to use the square root of minus one. <laughs> and um, you're actually also allowed to take roots of this guy here. This is a um, nice exercise in algebraic number theory to show that this, this element, the dth root, this guy here, is in, in, inside a CM field. And so it's in the maximal CM field. Same effect here happens as with the dth root of two. If you take d to infinity, the height of this guy here will go to, go to zero. So there's a nice formula actually you can always use. The height of alpha to the d or alpha to the k is k modulus of k times head of alpha. So it's a general, general fact. So it shows that this guy here goes to zero and that you're just doing a Q2 extension. <coughs> <coughs> The second feature of fields with the Bogomolov property is that the underlying group structure, uh, the algebraic group and the, the multiplicative part of the field is, is severely restricted. So this is maybe a second remark. The multiplicative group of, of F is severely, severely, very restricted. make this precise right now. So this is also, uh, this is a result that was mentioned to me by, by Jeff Waller last year in, in Pisa. Let the gamma be a general abelian group. Later on, I'm going to take gamma equal to this group here, the multiplicative group of F modulo of the roots of unity in F. Um, <coughs> There's a concept of a norm on, on groups, and it's, it's kind of the obvious thing you could think of. A norm on a group or a discrete norm on, on gamma is, is a map that takes an element of gamma to a non-zero, non-negative uh, real number and satisfies the obvious things you would want from a norm, namely your positive definite. Second property is that you're homogeneous. And the third, third property is that you satisfy the triangle inequality.
these are three properties that hold for our height function. Uh, well, writing things here additively, but you see that this property here is exactly the formula I wrote above. <coughs> you, have to, you have to mod out the torsion in order to get positive definiteness here. And this is something that holds just by using elementary estimates. So that's what a discrete group is. And a dis uh, that's what a norm group is. And a discretely normed group is a group if is a norm group where you have uh, that you can't approximate zero. So there is there exists an epsilon greater than zero such that if g is non-zero, then its norm is at least epsilon. <coughs> okay, so this is the main example. My talk will be the height. On the multiplicative group modulo the torsion of the multiplicative group, so you have to you can show that the height actually factors through the quotient. And as I said, the, thir the first three properties are, are automatic. They follow from basic properties of the height. And the fourth property is exactly satisfied when the field F satisfies the Bogomolov property. <coughs> so the main fact about discretely normed abelian groups is the following theorem due to Lorentz. Steprons. So these are three independent proofs and um, Sorzito. And they were all published, for at least these, these two guys, or at least w one pair published in the same uh, journal, essentially in the same year. And uh, they were all published around 84 and 84, 85. And the theorem says that discretely normed Well, it implies free. And by free, I mean free abelian here in this context. So a discretely norm group is a free abelian group. <coughs> so the corollary, if F satisfies Bogomolov, then the multiplicative group of F is isomorphic as a group to the torsion. The the roots of unity contained in F plus a free part, and the free part always has to have countable infinite rank. <coughs> this is a pretty severe restriction on the multiplicative group of a field. And, it satis and if F satisfies the Bogomolov property, then you have this. I'm not sure if the converse also holds. So I don't know if an example of a, a field um, for example, that, that has this structure here in the multiplicative group, but does not sat satisfy Bogomolov. <coughs> Let's look at some other fields. Um, first, we had the maximal totally real extension of Q. And there's actually a p-adic version of this result. So this is uh, theorem due to Bombieri and Zanier. Start out with the Galois extension of Q. such that there exists a prime and an embedding of F into a finite extension of p -addicts. So this is, well, Shinzo said, well, if you have a field, a Galois extension of Q, uh, such that you get an embedding into the reals, well then, of course, all embeddings, uh, all em complex embeddings are actually real embeddings, and then you have the Bogomolov property, and this p version says the same thing. So in this case, you have F has P. So 
this is p-adic somewhere in, in some sense this is p-adic p -adic Schimpfer. <coughs> so just as an example of a field you could you get out here, for example, if you adjoin all cube roots of primes and for example, a, and maybe also root of minus three, then you get an infinite extension of Q, but uh, it embeds into a finite extension of, of Q P actually for, er for every P. And so that satisfies this, this hypothesis here. <coughs> okay. So this is kind of one, one class of examples that imposes a restriction on, on a place on the, either the infinite place or a prime p. And there's a second class of examples that imposes yeah, a restriction. Okay, so the second example I want to get to are fields that have uh, particular Galois groups. So the, the first maybe example along these lines is <coughs> result of Amorosa Dvornicic. If you take the field, the algebraic extension of Q generated by all roots of one. And this field has a Bogomolov property. It's not, it's, not a field, it's not a finite extension of Q for the reason, I mean, a root of unity can have arbitrary large degree over Q. <coughs> Their explicit constants are also known. <coughs> this is the same thing as a maximal abelian extension of Q. So it's the largest Galois extension with, with an abelian Galois group. And uh, that was then generalized by Amoroso Zanyi. If K is a number field, uh, there's, a, there's a value of epsilon on. We give log 5 over 12 as a possibility, hmm. which is not known to be just possible. I guess lo they, they expect log 7 over 12 to be just possible. <coughs> So the generalization of this, if you look at, I mean if, if you look at this field here, so you can replace Q by any number field, look at the maximal abelian extension of a number field, and ask yourself if this guy is Bogomolov, and that's the content of their theorem here. And also here the, the bounds are explicit. And I believe you don't need equity distribution for this result. <coughs> <coughs> Okay. Well, from some point of view, what are the roots of unities? They're, they're, they're just torsion points on a certain group. It's just the torsion points on the multiplicative group of, of the field of algebraic numbers. Just another way to write down this field, this is the theorem of Kronecker Weber. Just a, a different way of writing it is saying that this is a field generated by the f points of finite order on a certain algebraic group, namely the multiplicative group. <coughs> next example, the next simplest example of an algebraic group to consider would be, for example, would be an elliptic curve. So say, elliptic curve in Weierstrass form is just a a plain algebraic cur curve, um, classically known to have a group structure on it. I'm going to assume that A and B are rationals for the moment. You have to assume that their certain discriminant is non-zero to avoid singular points.
and the complex points of my elliptic curve are a group. They have a group of torsion points. The group of torsion points itself is isomorphic as a group to I mean, the group of complex points is just a torus, and um, rash is a point of finite order, which is d mod at d mod z squared. <coughs> so this is the torsion of my elliptic curve. I guess the elliptic analog of Amoroso Jornicic would ask, does the field generated by the torsion have this Bogomolov property? <coughs> Get the answer in a minute. But for elliptic curves, they come in two different flavors. So there are two different kinds of elliptic curves. Roughly speaking, you have elliptic curves that have additional endomorphisms. So if, you, if the endomorphism ring of my elliptic curve is not trivial, then this is also classical. The field generated by the torsion of elliptic curves is actually a subfield of an abelian extension of some other, of some number field. So this number field is closely related to the endomorphism ring here. Exactly, yeah. So you look at this equation here. I, you, know, you take x, y, just add all x, y that appear as no, non-trivial torsion points. So um, how about just having the abelian of the structure? Well, if you, I, it depends on the, the q isomorphism class of the elliptic curve. So if you, I mean, if you, if you do a twist, you may get another field here. <coughs> So if, if you have complex multiplication, this is one, one situation that you can uh, have that, then you're already uh, in an abelian extension of some other num of some number field. And in this case, you have a result that tells you that this field has Bogomolov property. And so the subfield inherits it too. It's just a smaller field. <coughs> so in this case, everything is settled. But the generic elliptic curve over Q, you would, you would expect not to have complex multiplication. So this is somehow an exceptional setting situation. So in general, you would expect the only endomorphisms of E are multiplication by an integer. <coughs> in this case, there is a result of Serre from the 70s that gives us some information on the Galois group. So it is a, this is a Galois extension. And Sarah tells us that this Galois group attached to this extension is essentially a two by two matrix group. There's coefficients in a preferring. And the inclusion here, it's not, it's never equality, but it's always a finite index. And finite index somehow means it's, well, the, the group itself is, is, is too far away from being abelian to actually reduce to this state. So there's no finite index abelian subgroup of this group here. <coughs> okay, so nevertheless, we have the theorem. And this only holds at the moment for elliptic curves over Q. And this guy here is Bogomolov. You ask me why I'm, you can also look at elliptic curves over more general fields of, than Q. 
the reason why I'm restraining to, to Q is I need a result of Elkies that's at the moment only known for elliptic curves over Q. So Elkies proved that the elliptic curve, that E has super singular reduction at infinitely many primes. As a result, it's known for elliptic curves defined over number fields with at least one embedding into the real numbers, but it's not known for general elliptic curves over number fields. So uses Elkies a super singular reduction. So that's why we need E over Q. And it also relies on this theorem of Healy on equidistribution. And on the theorem of Serre here, even though it looks like Serre's theorem is working against us, showing that the, uh, the, the Galois group is non-abelian, uh, the information actually Actually works. Excuse me? In your proof, what is it that you do? Is there some method that you use to solve for the Well, yeah, you, you start out. You, well, you, you start out with, you try to prove it by contradiction. You start out with the sequence of points with height tending to zero. And then you construct out of this an auxiliary sequence through some induction step. And this auxiliary sequence still has height tending to zero. And that will, and you, you, you know that that will contradict Healy's theorem. <coughs> but I guess the central ingredient is, is more Elkie's theorem here. There may be a way to get around equidistribution. <coughs> now, you least one P, but you need to have it sufficiently, you have to have, uh, that's a mod P. Right, you need mod P representation for checking. So if this is known uniformly, if this were known uniformly, then you could probably get by you something weaker there. Yeah, so, uh, so there's a consequence for the multiplicative group of the field, and I forgot to say, so of course there's also a consequence. In any case, you have Bogomolov, you know that the multiplicative group of the field modulo torsion is a free group. Um, <coughs> and But these facts were sometimes known much earlier, so, so I think, uh, Warren May proved in the 1970s that the multiplicative group of this field, modulo torsion, is, um, is a free group. <coughs> so what else you can do is, uh, I mean, you have the elliptic curve, this form. You can also look at points on the elliptic curve, such as, well, um, projective points, um, and look at their height. See if you can say something about, about the height of points on the elliptic curve that are defined over special fields. So there's a, n a natural way to define a height on the, on the elliptic curve. So let's say we start out with point x, y on algebraic on E. So I'm excluding the point at infinity now. Um, <coughs> of course, you could just take the height of the x-coordinate. Uh, that's not such a good thing to do because, well, the, as we saw before, the height is actually somehow supposed to be related to the multiplicative group of the field. And now we want to get, get a height that's more closely related to the, the group structure on, my ellip on the elliptic curve. And so what you do is, as a trick to normalize the thing, you, you multiply a point here <coughs> with some large power of, of two. That'll make the point, the height of the point increase. And to compensate that, you divide by four to the n and take the limit. So that kind of evens out or homogenizes the height. And what you get is the so-called Nairn Tate height of P. So this construction, the, the, the fact that this limit exists is a result due to Tate, and this is sometimes also called the Nairn Tate height. So you can, there's also a, a way to define the Nairn Tate height that doesn't involve taking a limit, but this is, so I guess this is the shortest way to write it down on the blackboard at least. <coughs> 
So you can try to recover everything I did in the first part of my talk on, on, on number fields. Try to prove similar statements for, uh, for Neron Tate heights on elliptic curves. So I'm just going to give an example. This is a, a result due to, to Matt Baker, and then generalized by, by Silverman in the 90s. Um, moment just for any elliptic curve now over, over a number field. Then there exists a positive epsilon such that if my point is defined on the, the elliptic curve and the coordinates are in a field in the, in the belly enclosure of, of the number field k, then you have either height is 0 or the height is at least epsilon. So you still I have this. Yeah, exactly. This is normalized, so this is, yeah, this is one of the advantages of taking this limit here. So you get height is zero if and only if torsion. So this would be the elliptic version of Amoroso Zanier. And there are elliptic versions of all the other, essentially all the other results I mentioned in the first part of my talk. So I'm not going to write everything down, but more work by sometimes also in the context of abelian varieties. All right, Sosa, Gubler, Hindry. Plotmeyer, Matazzi, and Chang. So I guess any any result I mentioned before was has somehow has an elliptic analog here, and so does that theorem over there. Same hypothesis I have to work with an elliptic curve over Q. Then there exists an epsilon strictly positive such that if P is on my elliptic curve, now defined the X and Y are the contained in the field generated by the torsion of the elliptic curve. So it's kind of an awkward notation, E of Q of E tors. Um, now really have to admit a lot of torsion points because all torsion points are defined. This contains already all torsion points. So I have to be careful. So P is either a torsion point, meaning that the height is 0, or the height of P is at least epsilon. <coughs> In both cases, so the, the both theorems have a quite similar proof. So they also this one also relies on equidistribution, Alkis theorem and Serre's theorem. The equidistribution part is a bit more involved here because you also have to take Archimedean non-Archimedean places in the <laughs> Now, as for the multiplicative group of a field, there's also a consequence for the, the so-called motor vague group of the elliptic curve. So this is a general fact. Motor Vey theorem. If E is an elliptic curve over a number field,
and this is a finitely generated group. As opposed to the number field, so the multiplicative group is never finitely generated. <coughs> How we can try to use this result I mentioned before from by uh, this, uh, uh, discretely norm groups by, by Lawrence, uh, Steprons, and Zortito to study the group structure of this group here. <coughs> this is my group is going to be points on the elliptic curve defined over the field generated by the torsion. I'm going to mod out torsion itself and the norm I'm going to look at is uh, the narrow Tate height. Now you have to be careful, you're not allowed, to, you shouldn't take the narrow Tate height. The narrow Tate height is actually a quadratic form on the group, and so you have to take its square root. So this looks like, actually looks like an Euclidean metric here. <coughs> this satisfies all properties of being a, a norm on, on this abelian group, just from basic properties of the height. And the final property, the fourth property on discreteness, is the consequence of the theorem here. And so a corollary is the structure of this group here was well, a group there. This is isomorphic to the torsion part. Plus a free part. So this is this guy modulo torsion is a free group. And the rank here has to be has to be infinite, so that's a, something that can easily be shown. So it's uh, unfortunately not a finite rank, but to get some, but you still get that it's it's a free group, which <coughs> is not too surprising if you think of you somehow also have a formula that if you multiply a point by n, then you get you're multiplying its height by by n squared. So if you have the Bogomolov property, you're not allowed to take large roots. But this is actually saying a bit more. So not only is the group not, not divisible, it's, it's, it's free abelian. <coughs> okay, thanks for your attention. <coughs>